We're on, coach. What's going on, man? Not much, brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, for, for everybody watching out there, coach just taught me how to do this cool background. Look at this, the cool stadium view of what he's got. right here in Boom Picking Stadium. Let's go. You're right here, coming right out the tunnel with the team. Let's go. Let's do that. it, baby. We got to get back to that. We got to get back to that crowd right now. Look at that. 65,000 plus Boom Picking Stadium. Let's go. I like it, man. I like it. Bro, it is so cool that you're taking the time to do this, man. I know you guys, it's a little chaotic and everything that's happening is, man, it's it's really just unprecedented and, and families and just coaching and everything is so disrupted and so different. I guess in a way it's a good thing because it's giving you time off, if you will, to a degree, right? You can hang with your family a little more and get back to what's really important. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, I think it really puts, it's really putting things in perspective as far as what's important, um, you know, and really, really dialing back the activities, um, you know, just speaking on sports. I mean, my, my job revolves around sports and my kids are all involved in sports. And so that you've taken all those away, you know, the, it's really <laughs> pared back time and, um, you know, really added more time at home. And um, so, yeah, we're just trying to find that balance like everybody else and schedule and just a daily routine just to get into for, you know, obviously the long haul here next couple of months, just to kind of figure out how just keep going through this and figure out how to do it. So there's no right, wrong answer. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I, I think I do it wrong most days, I guess. Um, but I think, you know, my wife and I were just trying to, uh, we've got four kids. So we're just trying to keep them dialed in and keep them, you know, plugged in and connected. So, um, but it's, it's definitely had a lot more time here for, for us and just uh, really, really just dial it back and just, really get a lot of things done around the house and, and a lot of activities here. And so we got a 20 acre ranch here just outside of uh, Stillwater. So there's more, more than enough activities to keep everybody busy. Bro, let's jump into your story, man. Tell me kind of like where you grew up. I know you, where you went to college, but, but walk us through that. Yeah, no, I grew up on, uh, I grew up on the coast of Washington, uh, logging town about two hours west of Seattle, Washington, uh, Aberdeen, Washington, and was just right on the coast there. A little town I grew up in was Cosmopolis. We didn't even have a stoplight in the town. Um, it's on U.S. Highway 101, um, and we we're about 45 minutes from the beach. So whenever you tell people where you live, they'd say, "Oh, I never heard of that." I say, "You ever been to Ocean Shores or Westport on the on the coast?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, we go there all the time. <laughs> like just just go right through the town." So um, yeah, so I grew up there. My my dad was a a, a mill worker. My mom was a school cook. Um, you know, blue collar background. Um, I got a younger brother, three years younger. Um, so yeah, we uh, just grew up just, you know, just kind of blue collar. And then um, when I was a junior in high school, my dad's mill shut down. And so he took a severance check and they bought a U-Bake pizza place. And they opened that on a, you know, on a $6,000 check, they bought the place and started to open that. And that was 28 years ago. And so just a, a mom and pop deal, just a uh, restaurant going they they kind of run the full gambit I mean they had a full you know two stores they had a close to 100 employees at one time you know and then um, you know just kind of just kind of evolved and so that's uh, they still have the business today and they just have one shop now just kind of pared down but that was my junior year so um, they decided to do that instead of moving to Georgia um, and relocating to a different mill so they wanted to stay there because I was going into my senior year and then out of high school I ended up signing to Washington State and played played college ball for the Cougars and went to the Rose Bowl my senior year and got drafted by the, by the Seattle Seahawks and played three years in the NFL, played in the NFL Europe, uh, played the New Orleans Saints. Uh, and then once I got done in the NFL, I started high school coaching. I coached uh, three years of uh, high school football in the state of Washington, Lake Washington High School, Mount Spokane. And then I ended up getting going back to school and get my master's at uh, Whitworth College up in Spokane. And when I was right in the middle of that program is when the head coach of Montana State called and offered me the uh, offensive line job at Montana State at 29 years old. So that was a that was a definitely a God thing right there. I mean, it was an unbelievable opportunity. So I took that and uh, we went to Bozeman and I was there at Montana State for 13 years as the offensive line coach. And then uh, Mike Gundy hired me in 2015 here at Oklahoma State to coach the Cowboy backs, which is the hybrid tight end position. So a little out of my, uncom you know, out of my comfort zone. I never coached that position before, but um, it's a place that we wanted to be. Oklahoma State's very similar to Montana. It's, it's a ag-based culture. 
Um, you know, Stillwater's a great town. Oklahoma State's unbelievable university. You can see the stadium behind me. I mean, it's just the atmosphere is awesome. Um, so, yeah, we, my wife and the four kids, we really enjoy being here in Stillwater, and, you know, the transition's been awesome. Dude, and I think last time we talked to, wasn't there like one of your favorite uh, times in college? Wasn't there like some kind of play you guys got messed around on or something, like the Rose Bowl or something crazy? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that 98 Rose Bowl, that was against Michigan. And that was Charles Woodson and Brian Greasy and Ryan Leaf was our quarterback. And so we, we basically, it was the end of the game. We were down, we were down, we were behind. Uh, we were on like the minus five yard line. We ended up, we ended up driving the ball on a little fake, little, little trick play on a little hook and ladder play. We ended up getting down to like the 20 yard, plus 20 yard line from the minus four. And then we went to go spike the ball and the time ran off the clock. And so the game ended with two seconds left. You can't, <laughs> you can't end the play. You can't end the game on a spike with two seconds left. It doesn't, you got to run a play. So. The clock ended, and then uh, the game ended, and then Michigan ended up uh, sharing the national title with Nebraska that year. So, uh, yeah, and the game ended like that. So that was kind of crazy way to end it. So, <laughs> now also too, there was a, I remember you telling me that the college story, uh, or no, it was was the transition to the NFL where you started going and throwing tires, or you're working at a tire store, and then kind of how God opened the door, how that came together. Yeah, so um, when I got done in the NFL, you know, everybody's got plan A, nobody's got plan B, right? So um, I'm whatever, I was 23 years old, 24 years old at the time. And then, you know, you, I'm trying to go as, as hard as I can to, to make an NFL team. And, you know, been with the Seahawks and the Saints, was drafted. So I was trying to do everything I can there. I was thinking about plan A. I didn't have plan B. Well, when I got done with the Saints uh, in 2000, they cut me. Um, Actually, my wife and I had just found out, we just found out we had a miscarriage. So I literally, literally got cut by the Saints on like a Tuesday. And then on Thursday, we found out we had a miscarriage. And so, um, you know, our, our time in New Orleans didn't end so well. And so we had to pack up, um, you know, had a procedure and take care of that. And then we did, we packed up and then we went back to Seattle. And um, we went back to Seattle and we moved in with my sister-in-law and, and her husband. And I'm gonna tell you what, you know, everybody's got a low point in life, and that, that probably was my low point right there. Um, one of my low points, uh, you know, just you don't know which direction to go, you know, and, and I'm 6'5", 320 pounds, just got, you know, I'm in the shape of my life, you know, just playing with the NFL team, and then so then I just trying to figure out plan B. Um, so I, I, I worked out with a bunch of teams that year. I I uh, started coaching high school football. I showed up. The coach was found out I was in town, so he, he offered me to come out and coach. And and I was just, I mean, honestly, I was just, I was upset and I was mad at football. A lot of guys are when you get cut and it's you got no direction. You know, you just you're up, you're upset at the game. So I was just in a weird spot. But once I went out there and I started coaching the, the high school kids, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I always kind of knew I wanted to be a high school coach, but at that point in time, when I got out there, it just really, I knew that's what I wanted to do. But um, so I was trying to hang on with the NFL and kept working out. And so I, I worked out with like seven or eight teams that year, but nobody, you know, everybody, <laughs> it's always the same thing, man. Hey, don't call us. We'll call you, you know, every day uh, on Mondays in the NFL is workout day. So they have, they have fr uh, free agent tryouts. So they bring in 10, 12, 15 guys every Monday and you bring a suitcase in, you work out, they like you, you stay. If they don't, they give you a plane ticket and you go home. So I did that seven or eight times in the fall. So I got the message from God that just, you know, wasn't, you know, just it's time to hang them up. I had opportunities to go to the uh, XFL at that at that time, the first round, the, back to NFL Europe, Canadian League, arena football. But I played at the highest pinnacle and played the highest level, so I, I didn't want to do that. So I just decided that you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang it up and I'm gonna move on. And um, but the low point, you know, honestly, the low point what we talked about before was um, in order to keep working out, I took a little I took a little I answered an ad in the paper. It was ten dollars, ten dollars cash, and so I answered the ad. I showed up, and so what it was, it was a, it was a um, catering service out of a, out of a, uh, out of a garage, if you will. And so back then, that was like that was two thousand. So that that was the dot com boom in Seattle. So Yahoo, I mean, all those places were just booming. So basically, I would go in at four o'clock in the morning. I would load up my cooler with sandwiches, salads. I would make all these. I would wrap them all. I'd fill a cooler. 
I had a route. I, I would go in the, I would go into the dot com companies and walk around the cubicles and I would sell sandwiches out of the cooler or as I walked around the, the cubicle, you know, the, the offices. And everything was fine because I would do that in the morning, then I would go work out and then I would coach high school ball. So everything was fine. Well, one day on the route, the guy says, Hey, you look familiar. Go, do I know you? And I said, No, man. He's like, What's your name? I said, Phil. And he's like, Nah, really? He's like, oh, You look familiar. I'm like, Nah, you don't know me. Whatever. So I went on down my roads, uh, down my way. Well, <laughs> the next week when I came back, he's like, Hey, man, I looked you up. You're Jason McIntyre. You played college ball at Washington State. You just played, for, you were just drafted by the Seahawks. You're, why are you selling sandwiches? Like, what are you doing, bro? And I literally about lost, I, I lost it. I, I wanted to drive block this guy through the, through the building. You know, I'm still 320 pounds, <laughs> lifting NFL shape. And I, I lost my, I lost it. And that was it. That, that, that broke me. And uh, I got upset and I went out and I, <laughs> I ate all the sandwiches in the cooler. I threw the, I came in the, I came in the shop. I threw the cooler across the garage. I quit on the spot. <laughs> told the guy to pay me and that, that was it that was my that was that was an extreme low point right there and then on my route uh kind of long story here but on my route there was a company called Les Schwab and anybody up in the Pacific Northwest that's lived there Les Schwab is a, a tire company that's unbelievable um company and so I stopped at the tire shop and I I applied for a job and they hired me on the spot so within six months of working at the tire shop, I lost like 60 pounds. I went from like 320 to, two, to 260. I mean, it was unbelievable. I worked 14 hours a day changing tires. And <laughs> you want to talk about a humbling experience. I got a college degree. I mean, I graduated from, from Washington State with, with uh, a master and two minors. I mean, not a master, but my degree and two minors. And, and here I am changing tires. And um, so yeah, that was um, that was definitely a, that was definitely a turning point right there. I had to I had to decide which way to go. The manager sent me to he sent me to manager school at Les Schwab in Prineville, Oregon. So I went there for a week to become a manager at the tire store, and but I just knew that's not that's not what God intended me to do. I just knew that that's not the direction that He wanted me to go. You know, and there's I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I could have totally done it, but I just didn't. I didn't want to be inventorying brake parts at nine o'clock at night you know it just wasn't my it's just not the, the vision I had for myself so that's when I decided to go to Whitworth College and get my master's in teaching and get into coaching and at the time coach Price I played for Washington State I tried to get you know try to get him to get me a get into college coaching but I our first son Luke was on the way you know he hadn't been born yet but the I couldn't get into, I couldn't do a GA spot because it just, it paid nothing and it had no benefits. So I just couldn't do it. So I said, you know what, forget that. I'll, I'll just be a head high school coach. And so I gave up on the dream of coaching college football and I just started going down the path of high school. And then the head coach of Montana state called and offered me the job. So it, it was a, that was a total God thing. I mean, that was God opened the door there and, you know, I hadn't talked, I hadn't talked to that coach. I hadn't talked to him in, in three to four years. And he called me out of the blue and offered me the job on the spot. So, I mean, it was just, yeah, un unbelievable story. So, Dude, I love it. And just, you know, even I didn't realize that you guys had a miscarriage. We actually had before any of our kids were born. Was that before any of your kids were born? Yeah, we actually had two. We had one before that. So I, I had one when I was at the Seahawks, and then I had one when I was the Saints. And so, um, yeah, so we had two, two before Luke. So that was a – you know, that's a whole, that's a whole different, that's a whole different realm. And people out there dealing with that and battling through that, you know, I, the, there's hope, you know what I mean? There's hope. I can't even imagine. I mean, the thought process I had back at that point in time, going through two miscarriages and now I have four kids later, you know, and they're all, you know, we're at the, you know, high school ages, you know, they're, I got nine, you know, he's uh, 18, I got 18, 16, 13, and 11. <laughs> So back going through all those two miscarriages, you can't even, you can't even like wrap your brain around down the future at four kids later. And, you know, so you know, God is good that way for sure. So just, you know, obviously his timing is not our timing and it, that's easier said than done when you're going through it. Yeah. Amen, brother. We went through one and I remember just being so pissed. I was pissed at God. I was pissed at everybody, you know, and so walking mm -hmm. through that, it was, it was such a learning experience and knowing now that we've got three girls and just been blessed beyond measure for sure. But, but you know, what's interesting about that too is until we had one, 
then we started kind of talking to a few people. Everybody we talked to had had one or knew somebody who had mm-hmm. one. Or it was crazy how common that is, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you don't know until you really start having those conversations. So, so now I know there's an interesting story, connection between Dabo Sweeney and how you got the job at Oklahoma State. Tell us about that. Yeah. So when I was uh, when I was at Montana State uh, in 2011, I received the AFCA Coach of the Year Award. So that's the American Football Coaches Association. Um, they give out awards for the top top assistant coaches across the country for every level, for the Division One level, the FCS level, the Division Two, Division Three level. So I received the award for the for the football championship sub series that you know that year. And so um, so they have a convention every year and that convention that year happened to be in San Antonio at the river walk. Well, if anybody's ever been there, you know, it's uh, obviously expansive and there's lots of places to walk around. So um, we were, my wife and I, Ruth, we were, she came with me. And so we were in the hotel elevator. And as we stopped at the floor, the, the, the door opened and Dabo Sweeney and his wife walked on the elevator. I know who it was. I said, hello coach. And then I kind of left it at that. Well, my wife is the, the ultimate social butterfly, Ruth. She doesn't know a stranger. So she, um, you know, she started making conversation with his wife. I love your jacket. I love your shoes. Where'd you get those? And so they started striking up conversations. So coach and I started talking. So before you knew it, we ended up walking like five city blocks from our hotel to the, to the um, convention center in San Antonio. And then at the end I said, Hey coach, can I get your email? I'd like to stay in touch with you. You said, absolutely. I didn't even ask for a cell phone. I just said, can I get your email? So he said, sure. So we didn't see him again. It ended there. Well, then after I got back from the convention, literally once a month, I would email him. I just ask him a question. You know, coach, how, how would you do this? Or coach, what do you think about that? What would you do here? And within 15 or 20 minutes, Coach Sweeney would respond to my email with a heartfelt answer. Not, not just like a one word sentence. He would like bang out a paragraph. I mean, just a heartfelt deal. And that always just literally shocked me because I had guys, I had coaches in my office that wouldn't even respond to an email. And here's the head coach of Clemson University. And, uh, you know, he was responding back. So that went on for almost a year, um, just once a month, every once in a while. And we just kind of stepped, stayed in touch. Well, then the next, you know, the next year, whatever, I went to the convention. I said, hey, coach, can we meet up for coffee? And he said, absolutely. Well, then um, I, I was at a convention and I went to like a coach's party and uh, Coach Sweeney called me and said, hey, I'm down in the lobby. Can you meet? And I said, coach, I just uh, – I just made it to a party. Can we meet up a little bit later? He's like, uh, yeah, I'll be around. I hung up the phone. I'm like, you stupid ass. I go to Clemson just called you want, wanted to meet. Like, I called him right back. I called him right back. I said, coach, how long are you going to be there? He's like, I'm going to be there in about a half hour. I ran six city blocks. It was in, the, the convention was in Indianapolis that year. I ran six city blocks in downtown Indianapolis back to the JW Marriott Hotel. And I come, I come smoking in the hotel lobby and – Coach is like, hey, <laughs> and he's got all the staff there. They're fixing to go out to dinner. I mean, so he's got everybody there, and he pulls up a chair and says, sit down, I want to talk to you. And he says, hey, I just, uh, you know, I just talked to Mike Gundy. I'm a good friend of his. I recommended you for the offensive line job. And I, I literally did this. <laughs> you think you're being like, punked? <laughs> I was like, are you talking to me? Like, seriously, you, 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 and he said, yeah. He's like, I, I think you do a great job. You know, I, I know Mike a little bit. And so I recommended you. He's like, I don't know where it will go, but you know, maybe he'll give you a call. I said, coach, I appreciate that. And he's like, Hey, on second thing, he's like, I'd love for you and your son to come out to my football camp in Clemson. I lo- come work my camp and bring your son and he can do the camp. And I said, absolutely coach. Well, yeah, love to, I'll, we'll work it out. So I left the convention, super fired up, you know, all that, but I'm, I'm the camp coordinator at Montana state. So my job is to run all the summer camps, kindergarten through 12th grade. So there, in my brain, there's no way that I'm going to be able to leave my camps to go work Clemson football camp. And my wife, Ruth, said, you're going. <laughs> and I said, we, we can't pay for it. I don't want to have two pennies to rub together. And so my sister-in-law, Martha, paid for the plane tickets. And she said, you're going, to tell, you're, going to tell your, you're going to tell my head coach at the time, you're going to tell him that you're going to go work at Clemson. So I did. I said, Coach, I have an opportunity to go work Clemson. I'm going to go. And he said, well, how's he going to run camps? And I had, I had an assistant coach with me at the time, and he'd been with me forever. So 
I said, Kane will run it. I mean, he, he's my right-hand guy. He can totally handle it. So he did. He, he handled it. So Luke and I flew out to camp. We did. We were there for seven days. We did every camp. I worked every camp. My son did the camps. And the entire time, every, t- every Coach Sweeney was there the entire time. He literally high-fived 800 kids. I mean, he was there the whole time. He's, he's there. He's high-fiving. He's talking. He's hanging out. He's watching. Well, every time I'm coaching, he's literally within 10 yards of me watching every drill that I'm coaching. And then he would, would go on, right? So that year came and went. I never, I never talked to Coach Gundy. Nothing ever happened, which was fine. We worked at camp awesome. We had a good year at Montana State. Um, and then so the next year, the job opens up again at, Mon- at Oklahoma State. So I called Coach Sweeney again. I said, hey, Coach, you recommended me before. Anyway, you can call Coach Gundy again. So he said, sure, he would. So he called. I'm assuming he called. Well, the number that I had <laughs> – I was texting Coach Gundy once a week. Hey, Coach, I'm your guy. Hey, I would do a great job. You know, would love to be at Oklahoma State. But I never got a response. I mean, never, never, not one word. Not a, hey, positions filled, I, you know, nothing. I never heard a response. So, I, ultimately, I, I ended up just giving up. I, I stopped texting. So, it was the end of February in 2014, no, 2015, I guess. End of February, and I'm sitting in my office, and my cell phone rings, and it says Mike Gundy on my cell phone. So I, I pick it up, and, and Coach and I had a converse, brief conversation. He asked a few questions. Uh, and so we went through some dynamics a little bit. He said, okay, I'm going to make some phone calls. And then literally in the afternoon, probably that was a, probably at 10 o'clock in the morning, and literally by, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he called back and said, he's like, well, I made the phone calls I need to make, and so I, I'm willing to offer you the job. Would you know?" And before he could say what the salary was, I said yes. <laughs> He said, well, I haven't even told you how much you're going to make yet. I said, Coach, it doesn't matter. I said, I don't, it doesn't matter. You're offering me an opportunity to coach at Oklahoma State. I said, I'm all in. I mean, that would be a great spot for our family. I mean, I'd love to work for you. So that, that's how I got here. So he, he never came out, right, and said he talked to Dabo or whatever. I'm not really sure. Dabo never said, yeah, that was it. But, I mean, I don't know. Outside of God, I mean, again, that was God opening the door. Like, like he opened the door at Montana State. He opened the door at Oklahoma State. So, you know, if there's coaches out there, there's guys out there, and then some guys are, you know, struggling through some things. You know, I know it's, I know there's some dark times, but, you know, just keep the faith and just keep hope. And when God, when God's ready to open that door, he'll, he'll open that door. And there's no explanation for it, really. So, Dude, amen. I, I love it, brother. And just to, it's such a great story in what God's done throughout your life, right, in the journey and everything that you've been through how he's connected the the people and opened the doors and coming from that point when you were working at the tire store, right? You're like, what the heck, Lord? <laughs> you know, uh, but it, well, it, he has a way of humbling us <laughs> to get our attention too, which I love because I need to be humbled all the time. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, as you look back to your life and you really, really look at the different times that um, the different seasons that you go through. We all go through different seasons, and you already talked about a journey. Everybody's got a different – my story is different than your story, you know, and somebody else's story is different than both of our stories. But it's amazing. It's amazing what your story can – how it can affect somebody else. I mean, just look what you're doing with the father effect and all that you're doing there. I mean, that that's through your story, you know. And, and I hope that, you know, over time that people that have come across my story, hopefully that, that – energizes them or that gives them hope because there are guys out there, you know, in the coaching profession that are, you know, about ready to hang it up. I mean, I was about ready to hang it up. I don't know how many times. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's amazing. So you, you just don't know how close you are sometimes. You know? And you know what too, brother, it's, it's, it's in those midst of uh, struggle. It's amazing how God continues to show up. I mean, there have been times in my life I wanted to quit this ministry and the film and everything else a hundred times. And it was like, I just pray, okay, Lord, show me your hand still in this. And sure mm-hmm. enough, I'd get some email out of the, out of the blue about how this, that, and the other. And it's just like, okay, God, I hear you. I see you. And you know what? It's even that I'm not a big journaler, a person who journals, but my brother's always really, you know, suggested that I do it. And what's interesting is I can go back and look at those journals from years ago now and go, man, if there needs to be evidence of a God who loves me, is proud of me, believes in me, here's story after story after story. And that's what I love, dude, about your story and, and your story. 
And there's a coach out there right now that needs to hear this. And that's what I love. What's been your biggest struggle as a father? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think this time off and plugging back into my family and really just really having some personal time just to reflect a little bit. I think that, um, you know, things that I struggle with are um, being intentional, um, being intentional and being plugged into my family. Um, I'm, you know, as a college, as a division one coach, you just you pull any coach. I mean, not just division one, but I mean, you just pull in so many different directions. And if you're left to those devices, you know, you're, you just, you're not, you're not there. I might be there physically sometimes, but I'm not there mentally. And so it's been really good. It's been this time, this downtime has been really good for my wife and I, Ruth, just to be able to just to honestly just reconnect and just talk. And she's really just revealed some things to me that I just need to continue to work on. And so the, yeah, the, those biggest things are just, just intentional, you know, um, putting my phone down, turning my phone off, getting off of, getting off of social media, you know, I mean, it, it's very important through work and recruiting and all those different things. But I mean, I just, you just got to put it away sometimes, you know, and also some things that I just, <laughs> I just need to keep working on myself. I mean, just personally things that I, I'm struggling with, you know, just mentally, um, you know, just keep working through those things. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot of times as, males i mean we put up this facade <laughs> we put up this facade because we're supposed to we're we think that we're supposed to be these superman we're supposed to be these you know unbelievable you know men of power and and we have all everything's going right and you know you think back to church uh four years you know four years and you know you walk into church or you know you you see different guys and how do conversations go they usually go hey john what's going on good how are things? Oh, good. Good. Hey, weather's really good, right? Yeah, we're gonna cook out. You know, works good. Whatever. It's like we're just real. <laughs> just superficial. Like, yep. I'm keeping you right here just because I can't. I can't even. I can't let you in. You know, I can't let you in because then it shows that I'm weak. It shows that I'm inferior. It shows that I, you know, I want to give up this facade that I'm the the super. <laughs> super dad, a super human guy, you know, and I got everything, all my stuff, all my ducks in order, which in, in reality, I don't, none of us do, uh, you know, and so, yeah, I think that's the reality sometimes, um, you know, so, yeah, I think that those are the things that I definitely struggle with, you know, the balance with work, um, you know, just, again, this is just a weird time, we're all in weird times, you know, I mean, you were talking about you're in sales, and, you know, coaching's like sales, and so, Literally, this time of year, I mean, we would be uh, – what's, what's the date today? Today is the 7th? Yep. Okay, so we would, we would be going into practice, spring practice number 11 tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, we would be knee-deep in spring ball right now, and then right off the heels of spring ball, then I would hit the road for five weeks for recruiting. So basically the month of May, I'm on the road recruiting, and then we have camps in June. And then our downtime is in July, and then August you hit, hit it for camp again. So then you're back in the season. So – I mean, just as far as like the, <laughs> that total cycles, you know, just trying to figure that out. But then, um, like I said, just, just plugging back in with the, with the kiddos and the family and, and uh, you know, trying to get things right there for sure. Dude, I love that you are such the real deal, brother. I love the authenticity and just the honesty and stuff. Cause I think so many men, and me included, I get in these times of isolation and like crud, I'm all jacked up and, Am I the only one? And, you know, just understanding that we're all messed up and we're just trying to figure this thing out together. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I love it, dude. And, and I think most guys can identify with that work life balance. It's that, man, how do you, that's a tricky thing. And, and yeah. I get wrapped up in it all the time. And my wife has to kind of sometimes pull me back or duck her head in the office and say, honey, <laughs> you know, it's time to come spend some time with the family and kids yeah. and whatever. So these things right here, I mean, sorry, the, you know, smartphones, those things right here. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the evil part sometimes, you know, just figuring out how to just, just walk away from that thing. Cause everything's at yeah. your disposal, everything's at your fingertips, you know? And, and you so. know what, dude, I, I think we, the millennials have been given a, 
bad rap about the whole FOMO, fear of missing out. But I tell you what, I think adults in a lot of cases are just as bad, maybe even sometimes worse, that we're just constantly on our phone instead of maybe doing some other things that we should be doing. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you, bro. What did your dad teach you about being a man and a father? Yeah, uh, you know, my dad, my dad taught me that, um, you know, just, he was always there. Uh, you know, he, my dad, you know, he worked at a mill. So growing up, he works, he worked swing shifts. So he worked graveyard, swing shift, day shift. So his, his shifts were always, always messed up. But no matter what, he always made time to, he always made time to play catch. He always made time to make sure he was at my events, you know, all my games, baseball games, football games, whatever I was doing, he, he made sure he could be there. He wasn't at everything, but I knew that, I knew that his heart was there. And so he wanted to be there. So I, I think that's, that's carried over to me. Um, I think the other thing I've, I took from him is work ethic, you know, just being able to work and, you know, nothing's given to you in life. You know, there's no handouts. So if you want something, you have to go get it. You know, you have to be, be willing to put the work in and it may not be something necessarily you want to do at the time, but, um, you know, be willing to work and work at it and try to work to be the best at it. Um, so, you know, it was, yeah, it was good. Well, so what's the best thing about being a dad? I think the best thing about being a dad is that, you know, you, you know that you have other people that are counting on you. <laughs> you know, I think that the reality of that situation is not just about you. It's about the other people around you. It's about the other people that are, that are looking up to you, you know, and, um, you know, being a, being a role model, being a mentor, you know, and so that's where, you only get one. You only get one go at it. <laughs> you know, you don't get the you don't get to hit the rewind button. You get to go back and do it again. I mean, just like just like in a game, right? Just like in a football game, you, you get one shot at fourth fourth and goal for the win. You don't get to you don't get to hit. Say, hey, <laughs> I messed that up. <laughs> Let back. me have a do over. One more. I mean, I mean, you get one shot. You know, and so I think that I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to to make every play count, you know, but you do come up short, you do come up, you know, you do come up a little short sometimes, but just trying to work through that and, and obviously learn, you know, adapt, get better. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm always trying to do that. And, you know, with, with a, with a boy and three girls, my Luke is my oldest and I have three daughters, you know, we're, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot going on there. So just trying to, just trying to work through all that. What, as we wrap up, dude, Tell me if there's a new dad sitting in front of you right now and he says, hey, coach, give me one piece of advice that's going to be a game changer for me. What would you tell him? Yeah, I, I think the game changer would be love your wife. Show, show your kids, show your kids that you love your wife, you're affectionate with your wife, you're, you go out of your way to do things for your wife because then they, they see that. And then they want to em emulate that. And then ultimately their relationship at the end, you know, when they look to start having their family and they're looking for their spouses, they're going to look, you know, they're going to try to emulate what they've seen. And so, um, you know, I think that would be one of the biggest things, um, you know, and the other thing is just is make time, you know, make time. There's everybody's got hobbies, you know, but, as your family grows and your time constraints grow, then some of your hobbies just need to go to the wayside. You know, you just, I never had, you know, my, I, I, <laughs> when I was in Montana, I loved to fly fish cause I could go fly fish for a couple hours and get back home. But you know, golfing golf, my, my golf club stayed in the garage cause I didn't have five hours to go golf 18 holes. I didn't have the money to get a cart. <laughs> get it, you know, get a six pack of beer, do all that. I just, I couldn't do it. You know, I can go fish for a couple hours and get back home and have a little time and, and do that kind of stuff. And, you know, same thing here now in Oklahoma state. I mean, I, I really enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, uh, I got an old truck, so I got an old international truck. So I, I like to get Ruth in the truck and just go down the dirt roads and go for a little ride and, um, you know, and, you know, just do stuff like that, you know, so just, just find a little time, but then I just plug in with the kids, you know, just, just make time for them, be intentional. Um, Cause that at the end of the, at the end of the run, that's, that's the most important thing. You know, it's, it's not going to matter about, 
you know, how many jobs, you know, where you worked or what kind of car you drove or what kind of house you had or whatever, that's not going to matter. You know? Man, uh, brother, I appreciate you, man. I really do. And just the, the, you are the real deal, dude. And, and that's what I love about you, man. And I just, uh, uh, the friendship we've been able to, to have and just the short time that we've known each other and stuff. One of these times, uh, once all this chaos and craziness stops, I'm coming to Stillwater. I got to see on, this, this what did you say, 20-acre ranch? Yeah, come on, man. Let's go. All right. All right. I'm, I'm taking we'll you take, up on it, man. It, 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 hopefully this football season is going to start, too. I got to come to a game come on, for man. sure. I'll give you a tour of Boone Pickens right here. I'll give you – we'll go on a tour. I'll take you to Eskimo Joe's, get you some cheese fries. We'll do it right. That's what I'm talking about. Dude, cheese fries and chicken fried steak or whatever that's greasy and fattening, I'm all in. Come on, man. Let's go. Brother, thanks again for doing this. I know you're busy, man, and we'll reconnect here soon. Yeah. Hey, I really appreciate it, John. Just appreciate everything you do, man. It's awesome. Thanks, bro. See you soon.